Hello and welcome to the Spinach ICOM Natural History 2020 Virtual Conference. Uh, this is the third annual virtual education share fair, the first ever virtual version of this, this meeting, but a uh, third version of this session in general. This session will be recorded for later viewing. Thank you for all of us joining and thanks to all our speakers in the session. We're going over a special format in just one minute for this session. Uh, you all have uh, microphone and video um, abilities, so we do ask that you stay muted um, unless you're speaking and especially attendees, if you stay muted, it's unless you're asking a question during the Q&A portion. The chat function has also been made, made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees but please use this judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you, um, in you leaving or the session of, session of the chat function being disabled. And please bear with any technical difficulties we may have, which you already are doing and you're awesome. Oops. I'm changing slides on one screen, but not the other. There we go. Um, <laughs> I would like to introduce the planning committee and facilitators for this session. We have Jen Bauer from the University of Michigan and the Museum of Paleontology, Erica Krimmel from Florida State University, Anna Monfils from Sh Central Michigan University, uh, myself, I'm Molly Phillips from the University of Florida and Idig Bio, Julie Robinson from Miami, Miami University and Hepner Museum of Natural History, and Teresa Murad will be joining us from the Ecological Society of America. I also, uh, Talia Kareem, of course, should also be on this slide as well as our technical support and uh, wonderful uh, person. Uh, we have a Google Doc, which if someone could throw that link in the chat, or I will in just a second, uh, that has links to um, everything you'll need for the share session and as well as uh, ways that you can participate, add your own educational materials, ask questions to the share for your presenters, uh, sign in, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm gonna take, give this now to Anna, who's gonna talk about the Spinach Educational Sessional Committee. If you're ready for that, Anna. Mm -hmm. So emerging out of, um, um, you're staying with the slides, right? Yeah, Molly? I'll, I'll okay. still move them. <laughs> so emerging out of uh, last year's meeting and at a member at large position, we have looked at the fact that education, specifically relating to outreach K through 12 undergraduate education, not necessarily specific to training the next generation of spinach members, um, it really wasn't addressed in any of the committees that we had. And so we started the process of becoming an education committee with a sessional committee. And this is the share fair that has been run by Blue and I did bio for the last couple of years. We're gonna try to move into a more permanent fixture of spinach uh, headed up by the educational sessional committee. And I think we can move to the next slide. So one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure we were sharing and disseminating material um, as much as we could. And so Molly worked with the Spinach people to put together this website. Right now, it's the share fair materials from this meeting. So anyone who's interested in learning more or seeing the actual materials that were developed can go ahead and go to this site, click on them. There's all sorts of links there. Um, and the idea was that we can start archiving and pulling together resources so that people would have access to them over time. Okay. The, um, the second thing is we are trying to post these materials as open education resources so that our colleagues can go in, grab the resources. You can still have it as a DOI and as a publication, but that that's going to allow um, everyone to make adaptations and link those adaptations. And we have been working with the Cubes Hub on that. The goal moving forward is that as resources develop, we would then be able to um, share those resources and share them out better to the community. So today, the way that we're gonna run is we have three separate rounds. 
Now, in the past, we would have round tables. Uh, people would present at the different round tables and we'd shift three separate times. So we had looked at a couple of different options, but what we came up with on this was that we would take out these half hour periods of time, start them with um, three slide maximum presentations where someone will introduce a resource. Of course, far more material is about, about that resource is also available on the, the site I just showed you. Then we will open it up for a question and answer period of about 10 minutes. So we'll go through three iterations of this. The first one of them will be about cures and courses that are currently developed. The second will be about 3D models, um, uh, AR and different websites and apps. And the third round will be about specific modules and again, courses that have been developed in different places. At the end, there'll be a 10 minute conclusion and we are gonna have a guest speaker, Teresa Murad. She's, I think actually, come in or been involved in several of the share fairs. She's gonna talk about EcoEd. And then last, but of course not least, is gonna be just a survey getting feedback from the community about the resources, the share fair, how it went. So here's the survey link. I am sure that's gonna pop up in the chat a million times if we're lucky. Thank you, Anna. And I think now we should introduce our first moderator for round one. All right, so our first moderator is Jen Bauer, and she's the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection Manager at the University of Michigan uh, Museum of Paleontology. Thanks, Molly. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, which happens to be Anna, um, who will be presenting on following the data, a framework and support for course-based undergraduate research experience. And Molly, I think you were going to do the slides for me on that. Got it. I'm getting them up as we and I'll share it. Thank you. And then stop sharing. <laughs> All right, I'm going to mute though. Okay. Are you gonna put it in presentation mode? Oh, there you go. Thanks a lot, Molly. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk really briefly about a undergraduate research experience that we've been, we kind of developed out of the Biodiversity Literacy and Undergraduate Education, RCN, and that we've been implementing at Central Michigan University for about three years now. So it's gone through six iterations, I believe. This last spring, we developed it into an upper level course where it would be a whole semester research experience. Of course, that got a challenge of being put online and becoming virtual halfway through the semester. And so I'm gonna just give some very brief information about what's there. Sort of as, as a background, Blue is um, the Blue Data Network is a group that's funded through the National Science Foundation. Our goals are to cultivate a community around undergraduate education and biodiversity data, including biodiversity researchers, data scientists, and science educators. We are and have done a survey, I hope many of you participated, if not, it is on our website, to start to look at defining core biodiversity data literacy skills. What are those skills that we need people to have in order to be able to use these databases that we're creating? Then a big initiative is to move forward with those data skills. I don't think I'm on the next slide. Thanks. Move forward with the data skills um, and create modules. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is some of those materials that have been developed. And of course, the last part is really to reach as far into the community of educators as we can. So now it's the next slide. Thank you, Molly. So what I'm showing you here is a breakdown of the labs that we put into this form and function class. 
Um, critical to that is the fact that this is a class, a standard class in our curriculum. It's part of the vision and change recommendation for major sort of streams of content. So we are very much committed to a set of learning objectives, skills, and content. But what we realized when developing this course is that it lended itself very well to the data and the specimens in natural history museums. We were also committed to the idea of authentic data in the classroom and wanted to bring in some of the big data sets that are you know, online and freely accessible. And so throughout the course, we added modules that would open up opportunities for inquiry with the students and let them interact with that data, learn basic and core data skills, as well as um, some quantitative skills and some statistical skills. In about the middle of the semester, we started what was our undergraduate research experience. And that was, we call it communicating with the data. And the students worked in groups of four and would identify a question or um, a big idea, identify appropriate data sources and ways to analyze that data and visualize that data, and then pull it together as a team into a story that supports the research and the science, and that would be done as an infographic. And the next slide, Molly, please. So the, um, when we went to move it to the upper level, uh, which is like predominantly third and fourth year students, we wanted to make it something that was transferable. So a lot of the core skills needed modules that we would teach with. We borrowed some of those modules from others, such as Vedic Bio. There were some that were in development at the time. We had our librarian come over and do an ethics um, section for our students, a data ethics section. And as we looked through um, and developed those, the idea was you could use them in any class regardless of the topic. Then we also had guest lectures that were related to the specific science research that happened to be the research that I was doing. We extended out that communicating with the data to have a whole semester long portion that was a group project and something for the individual projects. And those just had a lot more benchmarks to them and very clear directives for students so that they would make progress through the semester. We also developed um, a set of pre-post assessments we had self-assessment of learning gains, self-assessment of 21st century workforce skills, which is included them even putting an entry into their CV of what it would look like to talk about the skills that they had. And then we did the first iteration, which we actually applied in the sophomore level class as well as the upper level class, which was looking at some problem-based sort of questions, essays, and multiple choice questions where the students had to work with data or work with questions talking about how they would use their digital data skills. I think that's it in the slides. So that's the, I, I think we're ready to move on. That was essentially our contribution. I encourage you to go look at the biodiversity literacy site. You'll see we have 22 separate modules up there. Thanks, Anna. Uh, we're going to be moving on to Dania, who will be presenting on providing authentic experiences, including museum-based learning opportunities and proper mentorship to prepare undergraduates to tackle global challenges using natural history collections. So this is, um, I think that might be Gordon, so. Don't forget to, oh. Yeah, I was talking to myself. <laughs> Apologies, I was asking if you guys can hear me, but clearly you could not hear me. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, so I will start the PowerPoint. I'm trying to introduce myself. All right, hello everybody. My name is Adania Fleming and I'm a PhD student at the University of Florida in the Department of Biology and I'm in the Florida Museum of Natural History and I work with IDIC Bio as a research assistant. And today I will be talking to you all about providing authentic experiences, including museum-based learning opportunities and proper mentorship for students. Um, it's a long title, so I'll hopefully it'll make sense as I go through the presentation. Um, I'm kind of going to tell a story and then a story leading to like what the produce of the product of that story was. So hopefully you guys enjoy this little journey with me. So what I'd like you all to do, wherever you're at, is think back to what brought you here. 
And when I say what brought you here, I'm trained as an ichthyologist. So whether you're an ichthyologist or herpetologist or ecologist or an evolutionary biologist or any type of ologist or maybe a data scientist or wherever you're at, wherever you're sitting, whatever role you're in, I would like you to take a minute to think back to what brought you there. So regardless of how you came to your current field, my own experiences got me thinking about ways I could help undergraduates find opportunities to get experience to explore natural history fields in a way that traditional classes do not. And the aim was experience to a big extent is what some of you may have taught back to. So thinking of myself being an ichthyologist, it might have been early career, maybe fishing with a parent or going to a camp and catching that really cool fish. It might be camping, hiking with peers, friends, sisters, siblings. It might have been a class early on in life and that teacher that just stuck with you and is like, I want to do this thing and figure it out. Or sometimes it's later on, later on in, early, later on in your academic career, you kind of realize where you want to go. Regardless, it's some type of experience. And for me, I was trying to figure out how do we provide experiences to help students make these career decisions. And so the main thing I want to focus here is focus on careers. So students come into degrees, they go into the undergrad, they go through the motions, they, they get A's or whatever they might get, wherever they're from. And oftentimes I've heard stories of, I don't know what's going to happen next. And so how do we help them as they're progressing in their careers, in their academic careers to prepare for life after undergrad? And for me, based on my experiences, the research collection seems to be a really good place to kind of help us answer this question. And here is the photo of the Florida Museum and one of my mentees working with um, one of the collection managers, Rob Robbins, at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And so why collections? Anna pointed out before in, in her module, but for me, thinking about my perspective is diversity of the people in the collection, thinking about the different areas and backgrounds and interests, the taxa, so it spans a wide array, and the questions, because we have all these specimens we've collected from over a long period of time, and so you can ask so many questions from them. And the challenge talking to students and from my experience is trying to figure out, one, students don't necessarily always have the knowledge that collections exist, and they don't understand that it's not just dead things. So here we're looking at a specimen, but you can get all this data to then help you answer all these questions and then situate yourself in terms of where you're going next as an undergrad. And then time. So undergrads, especially those from underrepresented groups, do not have time to volunteer. They want the experience, but they can't volunteer because they, you oftentimes, literature shows that they're compelled to maybe have to work to balance the cost of school, or there's other constraints there. And so for me, one of the answers was an intro course. So an intro course to natural history museums. And the idea was students would understand the relevance of natural history collections, thinking about the importance of scientific knowledge that we generate within museums. They could collaborate across different disciplines. And here we're looking at um, one cohort of my students and they could understand the nature of science. So not just doing science, but understanding why? How is it generated? What is the process? Is it just linear or is it more than that by doing it? And then for me, the most important part is career exploration. So looking at experiential learning to help students figure out where they want to go in terms of their future trajectories. And so really quickly, just to run through the model of the course, students have feel and lab experiences. So they get to work with they get paired with mentors based on their experience, based on their choices. So they have professional mentorship in the museum. They write a scientific guided paper and guided by that, I mean, it's not the paper they're turning at the end of the semester. Based on their interest, they do research and they actually answer a question and they get support throughout the semester to talk about that. And I can talk about that more in the Q&A. There's a poster presentation at the end. This year it was switched to virtual in the third iteration of the course. There's networking throughout the museum, within the lab that they're in and across the museum. And there's reflection. There's multiple assignments in the course that allow students to reflect on the experiences while they're having them. 
And so the future plans, right now I'm working on a publication to evaluate the impact over the, through the last three iterations. And there's a network, I'll talk about this in, the next, in my next session at 11.25, that's forming to help. Hey, yeah, Dania, you're a little bit over. Could you? Okay. Sorry, that's it. Sorry, thank you. Thanks. So thank you for listening and apologies for going. I think I went a minute over, I'm sorry. Uh, is Katie Pearson present? She is our third presenter. No? You know, you know what, Jen? I'm, we're not sure that Katie. Um, we don't think she's here right now, so maybe we could move to questions, and then we could switch to Katie if she shows up. Uh, I think she provided a, a video, oh, okay. so we could play the video ahead of time. Great. Molly, are you okay to share that? Um, sure, let me see if I can. Um, we could also put the video in the chat so folks could view it on their own as well, just in case. Uh, Celia, has videos been sharing well? Um, yeah, so when you share the video um, and you click the pop-up share screen, um, there'll be two little buttons at the bottom of that pop-up window. You need to click those. Okay and it should sync the video just fine for you. Okay, all right, I'll give it a try then. Uh. All right, I'm gonna mute myself and share the video and I guess holler if you guys can't hear the, the sound. Darlene and uh, Michaeline know that we've we've practiced this. So. <laughs> Molly, we're not seeing or hearing anything right now. Now we're seeing. Hi, I'm Katie Pearson, and I'd like to tell you about a course-based undergraduate research experience developed by the California Phonology Network. The California Phonology Network is a collaboration of 22 California herbaria funded by the National Science Foundation to advance the digitization of herbarium specimens. The California Phonology Network developed a 10-week undergraduate research course to engage students with the newly digitized herbarium specimen data improve students' biodiversity literacy and scientific engagement, and create novel data on how plants are responding to climate change. Students conduct original research using data they both harvest and create from digitized herbarium specimens that have been aggregated on the California Phonology Network's data portal, CCH2. Specifically, students develop a question about how plants' phenological events, such as flowering or fruiting time, change with climate factors such as temperature or precipitation. The overall arc of the course is fairly simple. Students will gain background knowledge on phenological research using herbarium specimens from core readings, then use that knowledge to define a research question based on the effects of climate on phenological events of a certain study taxon. They then score the phenology of the specimens of their study taxon using the new phenological scoring tools we developed in the CCH2 data portal that allow the editor to score for the presence of reproductive structures in a standardized way. The students then georeference some of their specimens to increase their dataset size, and they use provided R scripts to clean and analyze their data. In the end, they present their results as a research poster or paper. We developed all the materials for this course in winter 2020. These include an instructor's guide, syllabus, lecture slides, sample datasets for R demonstrations, assignments, protocols for using the portal and georeferencing, all R code for data cleaning and analyses, and a course assessment for gauging the success of the course. A pilot run of the course was conducted during the spring 2020 quarter at Cal Poly State University. The results of this pilot run were very exciting. These are only a few of the final research posters presented at our virtual poster symposium at the end of the class. Feedback and observations from the pilot run will inform future development of the course, which will continue through summer 2020. Some materials are already available on the California Phonology Network website. Stay tuned for updates. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Molly. Um, so if I could ask both Anna and Adania to share their 
video and be available for about 10 minutes for Q&A with the participants. Okay, I think we have a couple questions for, oh, Anna, you've already answered with the blue links. There is a question on the Google Doc, I believe. Um, did whomever asked that question want the links for blue or the links for the modules? There, if you actually go to the site, you should be able to find them under the resources tab. So it'd be pretty easy to find them there. We have a, a question in the chat about going to breakout rooms. And I think maybe it, um, we had to change the format a little bit because we moved, basically we just, we just moved to a new format when we switched to this Zoom room. We won't be going to breakout rooms. If you want to raise your hand in Zoom, uh, we could call on you and you can ask a question or there's the chat and you can type your question in the chat. Those are probably the, the two best places to ask questions right now. We can also ask questions of our audience. Um, for those of you that are here, uh, have any of you implemented cures or course like, you know, natural history collections in an entire course? And if so, you can add your experiences, any links or information in the Google Doc or, or raise your hand or type in the chat. So it can also be a discussion as well as questions for our panelists. So I'm also seeing a question um, from Darlene. Darlene, for the sophomore level course, there are up to 120 students in the course. So there's a whole bunch of labs that, are, that have 24 students in each of them. They are taught by TAs. The upper level course started off as 14 after the COVID going on to online. There were a few that opted out. So I'll answer the workload credit. I'm trying to follow because there's so many different places to put questions. I'm trying to find where they are. And then someone asked Katie a question um, as well. And I've heard Katie's talk. I have the same issue Katie does. It's often with the analysis. That the students aren't really fully trained on how to do some of the analyses and that can be a big constraint in the course. Um, the faculty workload, by the way, for this course was um, it was half my load. If the, I don't know how to translate that type of stuff. Um, so it, normally we teach three to four classes a semester. And so the, when we taught that, it was um, comparable to half of my load the first time. And after that, it was like one course. Thanks, Anna. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just I was going to address um, a question I was asked, not in the, to chat to everyone, but just to me. Um, but I wanted to give the answer to everybody. Um, the question that was asked to me was, was did I create the course that I explained as part of my dissertation? Um, and I should note, I'm getting my, I'm doing my PhD right now. I started in fall 2019. The class was created in, when I was a master's student in my last year of my master's, master's, and I've taught it three times as far. And it was created because of what I saw as the need to bring people into the museum space that may not be familiar with collections. And that's not to devalue that the museum already had undergrads in, in, within the collections working with folks, but I wanted to see if we can reach, kind of cast a wider reach to folks because we have a big university and a really huge museum. So it's trying to really stretch out to like broaden diversity in the students that I saw in the museum. Thanks, Adania. I think there's another question in the chat that's kind of broad, so maybe both of you could address it. What, if any, are the logistic issues with using museum resources such as spaces and collections? I can go first since I was just talking. Um, from my experience, I would say it depends on the size and the type of museum that you have. So I'm fortunate at the Florida Museum of Natural History that we have 
collection managers for each different taxa, meaning like we have a collection manager for etiology and herpetology and there's lots of folks there. And so I was able to tap into the resources of the people in the collections, the collection managers, the grad students and the postdocs. So the way I designed the course is I kind of look at a mutualistic relationship between the folks in the museum who would like to have students work with them and the students who need opportunities and peer students with mentors. There's training beforehand so that all the mentors have to meet ahead of time and kind of, to kind of situate themselves so that they're not just volunteers, they're not just sitting there to do busy work. They're, it's goal oriented and question oriented so they need a product in the end. Um, and so with using the resources, it basically tied to the collections managers, the students and the postdocs. And it's been a really good relationship just thus far. And in the, my next session, I'm gonna talk about how we can, if wherever you're at with what you have, using that building from folks who have similar courses to help create or amplify whatever you're doing at your institution. So I'll, t I'll take the next question because I don't bring the students very much into the museums and to be clear, I have a very small natural history collection at CMU. So we don't have access to some of the sources. So we are really pushing people to more of a virtual experience. Um, but uh, there's someone asking about K through 12 materials and the fact that most of the materials in the blue website are undergrad. We do have some collaborations with K through 12 educators there is a lot of overlap in some of the ways that we would do things. We are very, very open to getting K through 12 um, adaptations. And the, and I always say this, my students very favorite lab is the one where we blow bubbles. And so you really can take a lot of the same experiences and just translate them to the level you need students to understand. So um, I, it, who, Ada, who asked that, um, or Aga, Aga, who asked that, that's sort of my reply to that. And the other thing is our funding currently comes from the undergraduate biology education part of NSF. So we are mandated to be working pretty heavily in that area. There's a Thanks, question. Um, oh, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> there's one from Randy. Um, do either of you experience pushback from anyone at your institution about having courses or participating in outreach at the collection? I don't know that faculty all understand what we do in the collection, so there is a little bit of pushback. And from my perspective, I so initially I had to argue for why the course is important. Um, and I had to literally go around the museum and sort of lobby and speak to each collection manager and folks to see if they would buy into it. And I was fortunate that I did have buy-in. Um, but I, it, this kind of built on things I was doing before. So people know I was already actively trying to bring people into the space and uh, the museum was percept very percept receptive of that. Um, but I do know last year at the Spinach Share Fair, I met with other folks who wanted to do this and they, I just talk about that and parts of a grant and I'll talk about this, I don't wanna go into too much that we're working on is how to help folks wherever you're at with whatever you have, what it is in personal digital to get things going and I think that's why my next session is kind of called doing more with less. So trying to navigate those circumstances. Okay, we'll do one more question for Adania. And if you still have them, put them in the chat or on the document and she can pop in and answer those um, after the fact. So this one is specifically for Adania. Um, how many students are in your class? How long is your semester? What are their backgrounds, such as their majors? Okay, that's a very loaded question. So I'll try to make sure I address all of it. And if I don't, just stop me in between. So the first part was how many students? So this is the third iteration and it has changed. So I started off with 20 students because it was just me um, and Dave Blackburn, my advisor. He, on, I think he's on this call right now. My current PhD advisor was the faculty on record for that class because as a master's student, I could not teach by myself. And so because I was new to it and didn't know that I was doing 20 was the number, during early enrollment, the class filled up and I had requests from the biology department to increase numbers. So I increased it to 40 the year after. And this year I went back to 20 because I just started my PhD and I wanted to make sure I'm situated in my research, my science research, in addition to my biological education research interest. Um, we are working on a model to incorporate 80 plus students and that would 
work with peering with matching students and having like a research group with the similar we're using the same model of the course so that's how many the second part was how long so it's a spring taught class right now so all the spring semester um, I can give more details later about how the format of the class works but essentially they get introduced to the collection through tours and physically being there and then they start on projects towards the second half of the semester and present on their work and then the background so for me parts of the backgrounds it's open to anybody everybody who wants to be a part of this um, wants to learn about collections or is thinking about what am I going to do after my undergraduate career so I've had 15 different majors across five different colleges in the university it's my lot as far as I could remember and that's anything from a typical zoology biology geology majors to arts um, uh, statistics uh, I'm, bl I'm blanking here there's a lot of majors and a good example is I have an art student who took the class and she liked biology and she liked science but she was pushed away from that and she's changed her major to incorporate both her love for art and science and so that's kind of the idea is kind of just to situate things so it's open to all and right now it's open to all levels but I'm looking at a sophomore level going forward because a lot of students are like, I love this and I wish I had found it earlier. So I want to try to get them to be able to move forward. Because what usually happens is after the class, they continue on either they get positions in the museum, paid to continue their research. And many of them have a co-authoring publication. So the idea is not just the class, it's continuing. And I've talked with departments about having independent study after where we have a group to help them in that publication stance of moving things forward. Excellent. Thank you, Dania. So there were a couple more questions, so please check out the Google Docs so you could get those answered as well. Um, I'd like to introduce our next moderator, Julie Robinson, who is the museum educator for the Hefner Museum of Natural History and director of the Cecilia Berg Center for Environmental Education at Miami University. Thank you, Jen. Um, I, I wanted to take us back one more time to um, the K through 12 question because um, at the Hefner Museum, I teach an environmental education class for early childhood and middle childhood educators. So that through that class, they're working on certifications, but as part of it, they're also developing our discovery trunks, which is our big outreach program. And we'll be taking those trunks, the modules that are lo located in those trunks, and the trunks involve um, teacher guides, everything um, packed with inquiry activities and they also have specimens that go along with everything so everything is aligned to state standards and those educational standards are all also with NGSS so those will be also uploaded to um, Blue and Cubes Hub in future so I just wanted to point that out also. So um, now welcome to round two as a reminder, I want you to send your questions to the Google Doc in the chat and be sure to sign in. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Jonathan Hendricks, presenting on an online resource, Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. Jonathan, are you ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, can you set it up so I can share my screen? John, I just made you a co-host, so you should be able to do okay. that. Okay, super. So let me just get this started. Here we go. Is everybody, oh, there we go. Is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, good morning, everybody. It's, I know it's even earlier for some of you than it is for me. Um, what I'd like to do today is just take uh, a couple minutes to introduce um, some of the products of a broader uh, impact associated with two um, fossil digitization TCNs, the Paleo Niches TCN, which uh, started in 2008, and the Cretaceous World uh, TCN, which started, I think, in either 2015 or 2016. And this project began with my colleagues, uh, Bruce Lieberman at the University of Kansas and Alicia Stegall at Ohio University. And so what I want to do is just highlight um, a few of the uh, major components of the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life project. Um, and, and also acknowledge before I go any further, NSF um, support is, is gratefully recognized for, um, for supporting this project. Uh, 
the, the goal of the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life is to help um, anyone, but especially students, their teachers, and avocational paleontologists identify their fossil discoveries um, and also learn more about the history of life on Earth. When the project started out, um, the focus was really the generation of um, regional field guides to fossils. And we developed uh, regional field guides um, to fossils from the Ordovician period of the Cincinnati region. Jen Bauer, who's a, a moderator here with us uh, this morning, um, helped to build that uh, digital atlas when she was at Ohio University. Um, we also have a digital atlas to the Pennsylvanian of the uh, American Mid-Continent, the Cretaceous of the Western Interior Seaway, and the Neogene of the Southeastern United States. And so I encourage you to um, explore these uh, online field guides to fossils. Um, they're, they're sort of constructed just like uh, Peterson field guides to say birds or, or butterflies. I encourage you to check them out on your own time. I wanna note that we do have a, a free mobile app um, that ties in with these digital atlases that's now available for both um, Android and uh, Apple devices. I'd like to spend um, a couple minutes more talking about the uh, digital encyclopedia of ancient life. We call it the, the deal. It's a, it's a good deal. This is an online uh, open access textbook to paleontology. As far as we know, it's, it's the first of its kind. And it, it covers many um, different topics related to uh, paleontology and also evolutionary biology. I'll scroll through quickly here and you can just see some of the different chapters that are now online. It remains a work in progress. So we have chapters covering nature of the fossil record, geologic time, evolution, the practice of systematics, both taxonomy and phylogenetics, paleoecology, conservation, paleobiology. And then we have um, uh, detailed pages that focus on different groups of uh, animals, um, as well as plants. And, and we're also starting to include paleontological methods and technique chapters. Just to give you an example of what one of these looks like, we can go to um, cephalopods. Uh, and let's take a quick look at the page on, on ammonoids, which include the ammonites. I'll just sort of scroll through quickly here. We have information about their diversity through time, uh, their phylogenetic relationships. And then we've constructed throughout the digital encyclopedia new uh, uh, images that can be used for teaching to help students learn about the morphologies and anatomies of um, extinct creatures that all have Creative Commons licensing. Um, and one of the other fun things that we've built into the Digital Atlas project are 3D photogrammetry models of um, specimens from the collections of my home institution, the, the Paleontological research institution. Um, so these are all 3D scans that we've created over the last couple of years that are integrated throughout the, um, throughout the digital encyclopedia. They have annotations of features to help students uh, learn more about uh, these animals. And then we also have detailed uh, photographs of specimens from the, um, from the collections of PRI that illustrate different aspects of the morphology of, of the different major groups of um, organisms, in this case, uh, cephalopods. Um, the other, I'm going to go back a couple screens here, the other major component of the Digital Atlas project that we've really been focused on over the last uh, year is the development of a virtual collection of 3D models of fossil and uh, modern specimens, again, all from both the collections and the exhibits of PRI. Um, these are organized taxonomically. You can think about them um, as being akin to the drawers of specimens that we might uh, put out on tables for students to look at during a lab period. Um, because we've already looked at uh, uh, cephalopods, we'll just go back to the virtual collection that is uh, an additional resource that sort of builds on the digital encyclopedia page that I just showed. And again, um, what we highlight are, you know, different representative fossils belonging to particular taxonomic groups. So um, this page will just take a second to, to load up here. Um, John, you'll again, need to wrap up. Okay, that's, that's really it. The only other thing I'll, I'll just mention really quickly is that all of these have Creative Commons um, CC0 licensing on Sketchfab. You can download the models and do um, with them what you what you please. You can embed them in websites, you can 3D print them, you can, you can pretty much do what you want. Thank you.
Thank you so much, John. Um, uh, next, we will have Ann Basham. Uh, she'll be speaking on the virtual collection box, exploring potential use cases with web AR technologies. And are you ready? Uh, yes, and if I could um, share my screen, <laughs> get that activated. We'll so. do that now, Ann. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so can everybody see the um, virtual collection box website? <laughs> and I'll start there. Um, so um, good morning, everyone. I'm um, Ann Basham. I'm coming to you from Arizona this morning. Um, I'm project director of the Libraries Live Project and Explore More Labs. And um, I wanted to take this opportunity to um, kind of give you an update of, of Libraries Live Project. Um, I, I know some of you probably have, have already been I'm working with it, um, working with the application for the past few years. Um, but um, currently um, we are you know, working um, with um, web-based aug augmented reality. And I just wanted to um, share um, a little information about what that is and um, what are the potential um, use cases that we can um, use this new technology. Um, as you know, our, our most people are familiar now we're becoming more so um, by way of what augmented reality is. Um, it's um, the ability to superimpose um, virtual content over objects and physical space. Um, with web R, what's different about web um, R technology, um, it uses um, um, individuals um, inter yeah, on any device, um, your internet browser. And so basically you can exchange um, augmented reality content just um, through a URL link. And so this kind of um, opens up um, accessibility and the ability to collaborate. And um, so, yeah, we are really starting to um, do a lot of um, experimentation with it. Um, and of course it has a lot of advantages um, as well um, over the native um, applications in that um, you're able to quickly update and switch out content which is ideal for the teacher, obviously, in the classroom um, to be able to do that. Um, so to get kind of out of the ecosystem, so to speak, of um, native apps. Um, so um, that's kind of direction the augmented reality as a field overall is kind of going. And so we've been experimenting with um, augmented um, skulls for and teaching physical anthropology and um, for especially now when all of education is going online, um, I think it's even more imperative that we come up with some alternative um, solutions. And, um, and there's many departments who do, we really don't even have um, the physical skulls in their lab um, because they are very expensive. Um, so you having um, some virtual um, options. So this is a skull of a early hominid that, um, that's virtual um, that's and along with the content that's with it. Uh, and um, LEP Explore, just want a, a quick update on that. So we're continuing um, our work with the LEP Explore, which was um, started as part of the NSF funded um, LEPnet project, um, has since evolved and we're now um, also starting to um, use this web bar technology for that project. Um, to create virtual collection boxes, or what I call VCP, VCB, I should say, to represent collection trays. Um, so there's um, really no limit to um, what kind of um, content, but in, we've just started um, experimenting with just uh, some basic functions and being able to teach um, lep adopter um, classification. And so, you know, the difference between families um, species, at the species level um, but, and, and down to some basics of can you identify the moths from the butterflies in this collection box, basic, and um, ha encourage students to you know, to um, look at physical characteristics and um, what kind of criteria um, are the students using in um, making these differences or being able to identify the differences. So it's just kind of um, a training tool uh, in classification. Um, 
and um, after yeah the session today, you can you can just click on this link, then you can actually um, print out um, kind of the uh, image of this um, um, block collection box, and then you scan this QR code, and then scan the image, and then um, you can see what we have started to do. It's a work in progress. Uh, currently, yeah, we have just a few button features, but you can get the get the idea. We're hoping to. Um, uh, I, I'd add a lot of additional features such as audio distribution maps, maps, um, geolocation information, and so forth. Um, so um, in working with this technology, we, uh, um, our, our goal is to bridge the gap between the virtual um, and the tangible. And um, here we can see that this is actually an image of you know, a picture plant emerging out of the fossil rock. So we're finding that the computer vision um, that's used in this technology is quite um, uh, impressive in that it can um, actually um, decipher um, like an impressions, fossil impressions in rock and be able to read that. Um, so this was tested um, with some, um, with, um, one particular uh, fossil rock um, that featured coral. And yeah, you can wrap up, please. <laughs> okay. And so, um, my last point is just to make you aware that, you know, we are PAO and we are looking for collaboration. Um, and we, we want to reach out to um, all of your collection groups and who want to participate in testing um, this technology um, is by sending and submitting a picture, an image of either a collection box or an object, a 3D object. And we'll we'll do some testing and see how how it plays out. So we're, it's really mixed reality, um, kind of that we're looking at now. And that's all I have. Um, so if anyone happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Anne. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be answering questions at the end. We have our third presenter, Julie Bocor. The she'll be spe uh, speaking about the origin and diversity of armor. In, gilt, in girdled lizards, a case study of convergent evolution. Julie, are you ready? I am, if everybody can hear me and see my screen. Yes, yes, I can. Yes, okay, wonderful. All right, hi everybody. Yes, I'm Julie Boker. I'm coming from the University of Florida. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about looking at K-12 education. So that's been mentioned a few times. This is in partnership with the OVERT project. So this is the Open Vertebrate, that project that is led by Dave Blackburn. So this particular image that I have and some of these images that I'm going to use, this is the presentation that our teacher uses in the actual classroom with her students. So she was part of our professional development program last summer and it's Jennifer Brew. She is a teacher who is actually in Ohio she was one of nine teachers who came for the week to spend at the Florida Museum of Natural History in the collections. They learned about the overt project. They learned from taking a specimen off the museum shelf, scanning it, and then actually turning that digital image into something that they could use for the classroom. So Jennifer really latched on to the research done by Ed Stanley, who is up here in the corner with one of his lizards. Um, she was really intrigued by his research and decided to use that as a lesson to help her students to understand convergent evolution because students have a difficult time with that idea. Um, so that's what she decided to do. Um, so working with the OVERT project. So OVERT is a very ambitious project that is taking collections from, I think there's 16, 23, Dave's on here, he can correct me. Um, different institutions, really trying to get a sampling of the diversity of life, the diversity of vertebrates that we have. Um, so everything is being turned into these digital images. So the idea is how can teachers use these digital resources in the classroom? So learning about CT scanning, um, the teachers went through here, they heard different research talks and then they developed their lessons. What we found with the teachers, so with Jennifer looking at these armored lizards and thinking about the osteoderms that cover these lizards and how and why did these evolve. 
she chose to use a combination of images. So she has actual picture cards that she created for each of the lizards. And then combining that with digital images that the Overt Project created. So these are all different armored lizards that have been CT scanned and now they are in Sketchfab. This is part of the Blackburn Lab Sketchfab page. And as you can see, this is specifically for Jennifer, but this is open, everybody can use it. So she had her students using iPads going in and looking at these different lizards and being able to see their osteoderm percentage that they were covered. Then they took that information, compared it to the morphological data to try to figure out where these different lizards live. They had to do some research on their own and suggest an idea as to how these lizards evolved, these osteoderms. She then had them use Ed's research and look at the phylogenetic data as well, which then drove, drove home the point that just because they live in the same place or they have the same features does not mean that they're the most closely related. Wrapping this up, we were fortunate that this happened before we went completely virtual because Ed was able to Skype in with the class, which seemed to be the highlight for the students to actually talk to Ed, who they considered an evolution guru, um, and ask him questions about his research. And that was the culmination of this particular project. So Jennifer was originally gonna come join us again this summer, and we were going to fine tune this module, um, polish it up, and then also turn it into an online environment. So we are still gonna move forward with this. It's just taking a little bit more effort because we're having to do everything virtually instead of having Jen sitting right here with me. Um, but we'll be turning it into an online platform using this web-based inquiry science environment where we can actually embed these Sketchfab images directly in it and students can manipulate them on screen. So we are looking forward to doing that. And I can stop and take questions. Wonderful, Julie. Well, uh, we will. We can go ahead and open up for um, questions. Presenters, make sure that you are sharing your videos. Um, we have time for a 10 minute discussion with our three presenters. And I, I would like to, um, I see that on our, our Google Doc, we have several questions. Some of you have started um, answering them, but why maybe we could uh, do some of those aloud. Um, John, I think this one was for you. Given that you've chosen a CCO license, do you worry about all the people using your 3D models for commercial purposes? For example, 3D printing them or selling them? No, it, it's something we've talked about a little bit internally, but we sort of feel like the greater good is just to make everything open and just, you know, at the end of the day, we just want people to learn about fossils and, you know, enjoy exploring them. Um, so from my perspective, yeah, if a commercial, you know, video game producer, you know, wants to put our ammonites in her video game, fantastic, that's, that's fine with us. And it also sort of follows just PRI collections policy where our, you know, our digitized data and um, imagery receives CC0 licensing automatically. So no, it's, it's not a problem as far as we're concerned. Thank you. Um, and this question is for you. Is this all inverts or just lepidopterans? Uh, yes, yeah, for the initial um, prototype, I guess, if you will. It, yeah, we're using lepidoptera um, for, yeah, as kind of a continuation of the Lep Explorer project. Um, but it can be anything, basically. <laughs> anything you can take a picture of by way of um, the collection. Um, and, yeah, we, you can create those layers of information, you know, with, with any kind of object you want to feature. And in teaching collections in particular, um, this is really great for. And you also had another one that says, can you please share the contact info for submitting a test specimen or image? Yeah, it's on, my, on the website, um, Libraries Alive Arpeo Project. Um, I can uh, leave. I believe it's on the um, the share education share uh, link that was sent out, but I also I'll type it in here. Librariesoflife.org, um, and then just go to the uh, Arpeo page, um, and yeah, and there's just a little link there, and you can just upload 
Um, and we're, we're just kind of creating um, a little digital repository on there. Thanks, Anne. Uh -huh. uh, Julie, I see that uh, we have a question. Who funded the teacher to come to Florida for a week? You wanna um, share yeah, that? I, I think Dave answered that in the chat, but yes, this was part of participant support from the NSF funded overt project. So for that, and we actually have multiple years of funding for teachers. We didn't get to have the teachers this year, but we will have them hopefully back on campus next year. So we'll have another eight to 10 teachers joining us next year, next summer. Julie, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. Uh, then do your numbers wind up being, do you, do you see, or do you track the number of um, participants and, and those that they reach beyond that, you know, like their classrooms? Mm. We, we really don't. You know, we try to keep in touch with the teachers and find out if and when they implemented it with their students. So we can track that to a certain degree, but as far as their impact and reach to other teachers, we don't have that data and that's really just word of mouth. Um, some of the teachers are more successful with that. For instance, Jennifer Brew, who is the author of this particular module, Jen is really active in a lot of different environmental or different um, education outreach activities, both within Ohio and at the national level. So she, she's a great collaborator to be able to share this type of collections information. That's, that's wonderful. And another question came up. What libraries are you using? What libraries? Mm -hmm. They have some things here, 3JS, WebXR, A-Frame. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, just, we're using, we're experimenting with different third-party tools, some open source, some not. Um, actually, um, yeah, it's AWE, is a, um, some of the, the web are um, com um, companies, software companies out there who, there's actually very few of them, but there's more of them coming up all the time, so we're experimenting with those right now. But yeah, you can contact me if you want uh, more information on what we're experimenting with. Um, John, there's another question for you. Is the Atlas of Ancient Life able to include fossils from the Southern Hemisphere? Not yet, although, so we've got, we have an NSF proposal in review right now that would sort of revamp what the, how the field guides work and their coverage. Um, the initial coverage will still be sort of North American focus, just in terms of the, the partners that are on that proposal, but the idea is sort of re to rebuild the architecture so that it could be expanded to include far more regions, including outside of North America. Um, currently, though, it, it's, it's just sort of set up with four individual web pages just focused on particular regions. But the plan going forward, um, it, if we can attain that support, is to integrate these resources into a single platform. So that, that's the direction we'd like to go. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Excellent. Um, are there any more questions that I have missed? Um, um, I think we've got them. I, I, I just want to say too that everything that I've heard today, I've just, I'm in such awe because we're able to now, in being with the K through 12 audience that I work with, um, we're now able to take some, a specimen that is too fragile or maybe considered too expensive to replace, or maybe too dangerous to put in the hands of a child. And yet, we're able to bring all of this. It's, it's just, I think it's really outstanding. Um, does anyone else see any other questions that I might be missing? I wanted to add something to the question about tracking number of participants for uh, the lesson on armored lizards. Now that that resource is actually on the Cubes Hub, um, mm -hmm. Julie and the other authors will be able to go there and see how many times that resource has been viewed and downloaded from Cubes Hub only, of course. It won't, you know, if they're not accessing, if they're accessing from other websites, it won't track that. Um, and it'll also track any time um, educators upload adaptations to, of the resource back onto Cubes Hub. So you'll get some metrics that way. 
Thank you, Molly. And yeah, what, Molly's been great because she has taken all of the lessons that the teachers developed. So I think there's eight or nine of them because two teachers were kind of the same um, and moved those over into the CUBES platform. So really, really appreciate Molly doing that. So do we want to go on to the next module, the next round? That sounds great. Um, all right, well, Erica Kremel will be moderating that next session, and Erica is a digitization resources coordinator at iDigBio, and you may take the stage, Ms. Erica. Thank you, Julie. So welcome to round three. I just want to keep everyone updated. We're running about 10 minutes behind because of our, our Zoom situation, uh, but we, have, we do have time to go a little bit over, so. Yeah, uh, Erica, I was there's nothing scheduled after this so if we want to if people want to stick around and keep chatting we can i'm happy to keep the zoom room open awesome <clears throat> thanks talia okay so in round three we're focusing again on undergraduate modules and courses um, and as a reminder you're welcome to ask questions while people are presenting in the google doc or the chat um, and then we'll address those questions at the end of the next three speakers so we have a first uh, with us again, Anna Monfils, presenting on a module, Data is the New Science, Exploring Digital Biodiversity Data. And I'm going to share those slides for you. Does that sound good, Anna? Yeah, and I just want to point out that Katie Pearson, I think, just joined us. Um, so maybe when we do get to them, we can make sure that we give her a chance to ask any questions or for people to ask her questions. We just saw her name flash across the top. Yes, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a specific resource that we have at Blue, and this is sort of our introductory introduction to digitized biodiversity data and to museums. So I talked about it earlier as part of the, the undergraduate research experience, but where it really comes in is we've used it fairly frequently when developing educational workshops. So um, while it's coming up. <laughs> Can you see that now? Yep. So you okay. can just go to the second slide. The second one. Sorry. It's okay. Does this look better? Yep. Cool. So um, I tried to stick to a few slides, so this is actually all I'm going to show, but this kind of might tie in a little bit with what um, uh, was just mentioned by Molly. One of the things by posting our resources the way that we do is we link them all with open education resources on the Cubes Hub. And as you can see, just looking at following the data there, if anyone's screen is big enough, you can see that one's been viewed 895 times, it's been downloaded 252, and it's had one adaptation made. And so that kind of helps us do things like metrics that show the utility of the different resources that we develop. And so the big advantage to one, actually publish your materials, because then others can work with them, but it also provides you with sort of a deliverable for what you did. What I'm talking about today are two, we, we post them as two separate modules. They can be completely independent. The first one, following the data, starts with sort of a problem. And this is a problem of a federally listed butterfly that I do research with. And so we built it into a video that describes sort of what's going on with the butterfly and how we link together various different data sources. You follow graduate students going through different parts of the project and how they build on digital biodiversity resources. Um, and then the, so that's more of a passive experience with the students asking questions and just an introduction to the fact that there are digital data resources, they are used in research, and this is how they could be used. Um, for the data is the new science, that's more of a dive into looking at some potential resources. We start there with introducing them to three or four different data resources, and a couple of them, I think we have them go and look in GBIF. They look through I did bio. Sometimes we have them look through Arctos. They look at environmental data sets. And the idea is just to give them some familiarity. When we look at GBIF and we look at I did bio, we actually look to see if um, we ask students questions about occurrence data and whether it's observation based or specimen based. And they look at sort of distributions to see how they might be different and talk about the value of those data sets. 
One, uh, as you finish the exercise, we actually introduce them to data that comes from a study on um, solitary bees and orchids and pseudocopulations. And the really cool part about that is it uses citizen science data, specimen data from the, the bees, specimen data from the orchids, and climate data to address to whether there's some asynchrony that is occurring between the pollinator and the plant. So that's basically the idea of introducing them to data source and then themselves using the data to address the research question. Um, all of these materials are vetted. All of these materials are linked back to vision and change. Um, we make sure we develop them using backward design, design with a set of very clear learning objectives. And we do a password protective materials for educators that we are busy posting like crazy, but if anybody needs those, they can always contact us directly. Um, the other thing is, is that most, if not all of these materials have either been adapted or were pre-adapted to working with online, which really helps us as we're looking to moving to potentially online courses in the fall. So again, I think that's the end. Erica, the last slide. You've got about 30 seconds, but you but can you see can move it. But you can use the last slide. That's the, where you can go to look at the materials. We do have a listserv where we're going to start using a lot more often. We just got that up and active. We do tweet, so um, do tweet out your cool resources. And the other thing that Blue really wants to do is help you deliver your material. So if you're interested in this, interested in working with publishing those as, and getting a DOI and an official publication, we are thrilled and happy to help promote what you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Adania, if you'd like to get your screen up. We have with us our next presenter is Adania Fleming, also back for a second round, on using natural history collections to prepare undergrads for STEM careers, leveraging resources through the formation of a network. So doing more with less. And you can take it away whenever you're ready, Adania. Okay, thank you. One second, you have to pull up on it, perfect. Hi everybody, hello again if you've been here for a while. Um, my name is Adania Fleming. As I said earlier, and I am a PhD student in the biology department at the University of Florida. I'm in the Florida Museum of Natural History and I work with IDIC Bio. I added my email and my Twitter handle in case folks want to contact me, so pause for a quick second. Okay, so the topic of today, this presentation is using natural history collections to prepare undergrads for careers in STEM and we're leveraging resources. And the main idea here is doing more with less and we'll talk about this next. So moving from the initial presentation, I went to spinach last year for the first time. I'd created this course, I had taught it twice, and I wanted to know what other people were doing in terms of intro courses and trying to bring students into museum spaces to prepare them for careers in STEM. And I was fortunate to present, and then at the share fair, I was able to start a collaboration with the folks listed here, and we were initially intended to have a symposium at Spinach this year, but due to COVID, we're virtual, so we're not doing a symposium. Look out for that in the future because we are forming the network and we do want to talk more in detail about it. But what I'd like to take the time to do here is kind of just introduce what happened as a result of last year's Spinach meeting. One of the things that occurred was something called NODE acronyms. So what it means is a natural history organization for biodiversity and education the Node Network, and the main aim is to enhance undergraduate biodiversity education through specimen collections. And it's a, these are the folks, we actually wrote a grant, and these are the folks in that grant. Um, Paul says you can just, I'm not gonna read everybody's name. Perfect, all right. So there were three main objectives with this grant. One of them kind of stems from the course that I teach and other people teach across the US and across the globe. And so the idea was helping to strengthen teaching using classes, using museums. The second concept came from a natural history collections clubs. So many of you might know Kari Harris, who leads that charge using helping students kind of champion their own part, forming clubs. And then the third aspect is using the first two, creating natural history focus skill sets development. And that the idea was to collaborate with a bunch of already existing resources that 
have been spoken about here and you can find on Keeps Hub and other places as well. So in our, in our quest for this grant, one of the things that we looked at was where do collection clubs exist right now and where are their classes? And so trying to figure out that, you can see in this map, it's not evenly distributed if you're just looking in the US and we're not even looking globally here. And so the idea is how can we get this to spread across the country here and then globally across the world? Because we have collections all over, which means there's opportunities to engage students and bring people who would not necessarily be in the spaces and introduce them to careers that they might not necessarily be aware of via experiences, hands-on physical experiences, or we're also planning for virtual, because we know as in the present, collections are online and there's need to do that as well. So it's already been spoken about before, but one of the we're planning to use the collections portal. So the idea is aggregate aggregation, so you don't have to go to multiple places. The resources will be from here. And it's a really short presentation. There, I'm gonna post in the chat a link to this Google Drive. Uh, I started a coagulation of existing classes. And if you do have one, please add it to the, the link. If you don't have one and you wanna join or you wanna figure out how to start one, please also add information there. And I want to use this to plug BCNet. A lot of what we spoke about before, um, Anna talked about cures and, and Katie talked about cures and BCNet is trying to, is a grant that just got funded, a rapid grant, and they are going to be working on having different team cures developed for virtual teaching in upcoming fall and spring. And so this tiny URL, you can actually use it to post interest. We will post, hopefully we'll post that in the chat as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for giving me the chance to talk again and thank the folks on the steering committee for Note Grant and then the folks who were on the initial symposium and thank all of you for joining. Thank you so much, Adania. I think it might be great to post the links to those uh, resources in the Google Doc as well um, so that people can find them there. I'm going to transition to our next speakers. Can you all see this um, green and white slide that's up on the screen now? Yeah, we can see it, Erica. Awesome, thank you. At least I can. <laughs> okay. So next up, we have Micheline Golay and Darlene Panvini, and they'll be presenting on the power of data standards, investigate data standards within the context of the Alpine Chipmunk and the Grinnell study. Micheline and or Darlene, are you guys uh, ready? Yeah, yeah. I think Thank Darlene you. is still here. I'm Micheline. Um, this is a project we did with Molly um, and another uh, collaborator, Heather. Um, Zembler de Lorenzo, who's not here with us today on this. But we did it as part of the faculty mentoring network for Blue. So we were all um, trying out some of the Blue materials last fall. And um, through our collaborative um, experiences, we recognized the need for um, a new module um, to help students learn about data collection and um, sort of how important it is to think about what data you're collecting when you are um, out in the field and and then how to apply that to natural history collections and so um, what we had the students do in the activity and it's it's a module that has some sub modules so it can be broken up and um, I think we uh, timed it out in our classes it'd be about two and a half hours two hours something like that um, but you could definitely split split it up and do you know chunks on different days in a class the first um, activity is students um, create a sample a field notebook entry uh, as if they had just caught a chipmunk in a trap and what information they would collect about that animal in the field. Um, and obviously when students do that with very little direction, they're gonna be all over the place in terms of what they write down um, and how they write it down. And that's part of what we want them to be thinking about is, um, you know, if you write the date in one way and someone else writes the date in another way, and then you try to put those into a digitized database, um, you're gonna have trouble searching and things like that. So uh, then we introduced them to, you know, some natural history collections, um, especially those from Joseph Grinnell, who, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, was um, a very prolific collector. 
and took meticulous notes. And they are um, kind of an example for how um, a, a field researcher should um, collect information on things. And so those um, specimens from uh, earlier in, in the uh, 20th century, we look at those. Um, and then um, in the third part of the, the um, activity, um, we introduced them to Darwin Core and standardizing um, your data entry and, and writing the year in the same format so that you can find all of the collections from that year or writing the Latin name in the same format so that you can find all the collections from that um, or writing, you know, your country of origin or location in the same format so that students can start to understand how that could be, um, why we have standards and how to apply them. Darlene, you want to jump in? Yes, I can. Thank you. Hi, I'm Darlene Panvini. And um, so the next part after students have explored the Darwin core and looked at da data standards, then we use a case study uh, examining historical and current data. And the goal here is for them to see how important it is to keep uh, complete records and organize their data records uh, and to think about their own data collection habits. So they look at, uh, they go back to iDigBio and they look at uh, a specific data set on this alpine chipmunk uh, and the data that was collected uh, that from 1914 to 1920 by uh, Joseph Grinnell and his colleagues in Yosemite National Park. And the map that we have there, the map on the left shows that uh, data set and the, the map that students would uh, generate we then have them to look at a more current study um, that was done between 2000 and 2006. Um, and there, the students, you could take the time for them to go and, uh, and read this original paper, um, or you could have them just to tap in and look at the data uh, for the Alpine chipmunk uh, from this time period. The, the goal of this study between 2003 and 2006 was to resample the Yosemite transect to look at how climate change um, might have impacted small mammal communities in Yellowstone National Park. And the nice thing about this is because this park has been protected since the late 1800s, um, there's been um, little direct impact um, by humans on the landscape there. And so the authors of this paper may, were making the assumption that uh, changes in uh, animals could be attributed to climate change. So the students then change the dates uh, in iDigBio and they generate a second map. That would be the map on your right there. And they see that the distribution of this alpine chipmunk is much different. Um, and then they actually look at a graph from the paper that was published in 2008 by Moritz et al. Um, and in this graph, they're seeing uh, the actual elevational um, uh, occurrences of the chipmunk uh, from the historical and modern times that these authors published in this paper. Uh, and so students can see that there was a range shift in the occurrence of the Alpine uh, chipmunk. Uh, and then they have a chance to uh, reflect on uh, what they have found and particularly reflect on the importance of good data collection because if we had not had that original data from Joseph Grinnell in the early 1900s, then it would be hard to do the work that Morris et al. did uh, and published in their 2008 paper. So we see that this module could be used in a variety of courses like biology, ecology, wildlife, uh, research courses, um, environmental science courses, and um, we would be interested in uh, exploring with you other ways in which you could see uh, how uh, using a historical data set and a current data set uh, could help students the importance of data collection uh, in particular and having good records and standard ways of collecting data. So, so I'll just add to that real quickly if we still have time. Um, you know, we developed this thinking it would be a face to face, but it could very easily be done completely virtually um, as the students are working with um, um, digital data, data sets anyway. Um, and, and we think that it could be something, you know, I'm even going to use it with my undergraduate researchers just to talk about the skill of, you know, good record keeping and, and cleaning your data and things like that. So um, it's broadly a, applicable, not just, you know, to undergraduate classes, but, um, you know, working with graduate students or 
for um, other things too. Thank you guys so much. And we, we have about 10 minutes for questions uh, and more discussion with these three panelists. So um, Michaeline and Darlene, Adania and Anna are all available. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or Google Docs so far, but feel free to add them there. You can also uh, raise your hand and we can call on you and you can talk. Erica, there might be a good time too to do, let Katie answer that one question that was asked about sort of the that challenges. That is a great idea. Katie, in case you didn't know, which you probably already do, but we showed your video. So there was some exposure right. and that's where the question yeah. came from. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, well, the video was going to say just what I was going to say in person, so not a big difference. But um, someone asked, um, so just to, to recap, the, the course that we developed at Cal Poly is a 10-week uh, cure, and we used uh, herbarium specimen data to study plant phenology. So the, the main challenges that we had, the question that we got is one of them, what are the challenges to this course? And um, because this was the first run of the course, the main challenge was that we just had a lot of problems with the R scripts. Um, so these were developed um, pretty much in the um, winter 2020 quarter and then implemented in the spring 2020 quarter. And, um, and so they had not really been vetted, and there are a million and one ways that our scripts can um, break, so, so to speak, on the individual students' computers. So we had to do a lot of debugging, and um, surprisingly, the students were very willing to work with us through the bugs and even try to find some coding solutions on their own, even though many of the students did not have um, previous experience with our code. They really were looking forward to delving into it. And um, even when I was debugging, I was talking with one of the students over email and I was like, oh man, I'm so sorry for all these bugs. Thanks for being our guinea pigs. And he said, no problem. This is the most fun I've ever had in a course. This is like my favorite course right now. So that was really encouraging to see. Get um, some questions are how many students we had 19 students in this um, this run we didn't expect it to be that big but uh, I guess maybe with the we switched to virtual people decided they could add that on and then also what are the statistical analyses could we run this without using R uh, the statistical analyses were um, just using linear models so we used R for the data cleaning. Um, and then running those linear models. And theoretically, you could do this with a different um, statistical package, I'm sure. Thank you, Katie. And Thanks, you guys. <laughs> um, converting between time zones for this conference has been challenging for all of us. For sure, yes. And any, anyone else have any questions, especially for uh, Michaeline and Anna and Adania and Darlene? I have another question for Katie. My mic's on, I'm gonna ask it. Um, how translatable do you think this would be for using um, herbaria resources that are not from California? I'm thinking I'm in the Midwest and we have a, a consortium uh, that's digitized and I would be interested in using this with a class but doing it more, more local. Very translatable. So I think that the resources that we have right now are specific to the CCH2 portal. But if you have another portal and you're familiar with using that, you can completely do that. Um, the one potential hitch is that, so we developed a Symbiota um, tool, you know, within Symbiota that you use to um, score the phenology of the plant specimens. And um, theoretically, this is available, like if you got in contact with the web developer, you could actually implement this in the Symbiota portal. But if you're not directly connected to the collections, or um, if you're not a collections manager, I don't know um, what that dynamic would be about getting that into your portal. That being said, you can always have the students 
just take the data down on a spreadsheet. That's also not rock and science. Um, there's also a question, did I find a minimum specimen number below which data won't be useful? Oh, that's a fantastic question because uh, the, the students were asking this as well um, when we were trying to figure out, okay, how many specimens do you need so that once you clean the data, you still have enough to get some interesting results. And we found that, we found in previous studies, so I've done research in this realm, that you actually really only need about 100 specimens to be able to find relationships between phenology and climate if they exist. Um, but in order to get enough data after cleaning, then um, you usually need to start with like three or 400 specimens, depending on the data set that you're working with. Sometimes the data set that you're working with um, is mostly not imaged, so you don't have a lot of images of the specimens. In that case, um, that would just kind of increase the amount of specimens you would need if the percentage image or the percentage georeference is really low. Well. Thank you. And uh, Dania, do you have your hand up. Would you like to say something? Yes, I wanted to comment um, kind of on Katie's note earlier, not the last comment about students saying that it was their best experience. It kind of took me back to some of the students in my course. I've taught it three times, three years now, 2018, 2019, 2020. And I have, I want to just comment on that. Like students really appreciate being able to come into museum spaces, whether it's virtual or in person. A lot of them, like we have a big campus and they're trying to navigate a lot with their degrees. And if they're underrepresented, it's not, it's not something to even think about. They don't have time to. And so by creating these spaces and these opportunities where they can really tap into like, what am I doing this degree for is really helpful for them. And many students like have reviews where they've talked about, this is the most important class they've taken their whole semester. And it's not necessary or mandatory and not necessary or mandatory course. So I do implore you guys to like really use the collection to its benefit because it's definitely, especially now um, with having to you to work digitally and now that folks are talking about underrepresentation, like there's, it's even, you probably would get more traction to do these things. Um, and so I just want to encourage folks to do that. Um, and then another point I wanted to make uh, in the Google doc, the share Google doc, my advisor uh, posted a link about me. And so it kind of talks about like, one of the questions in there is how the class was created. It was not created as part of my research. It was created as a side project. Um, mainly because I wanted to see more people that look like me in the space that I was in and I was trying to understand why they weren't there. And one of the things I looked, realized was the impediment was time, as I kind of mentioned in my first project and trying to balance between, well, I have to take these classes and I need experience, but I can't do both. And so by making it um, credit based, the idea was then that they're able to accomplish both goals. And for when I created the class, something to think about is I it's in biology, but it's also in anthropology. And so people, students can get credit for either their degree or their minors. And so being thoughtful about how you're aware you're posting these classes and I'm working with the art department to open a section there. And so, thank you. That's a really pertinent comment. Thanks, Adania. You're welcome. I think at this point we'll transition to our conclusion. And so we have Teresa Murad with us from the Ecological Society of America. Molly, do you wanna say anything before we turn it over to Teresa? Sure. Uh, first of all, Teresa, if you wanna go ahead and share your, um, your video and turn on your mic. I think she had someone else she needed to be raised to co-host to Leah to share their screen. Teresa, if you could jump in and tell us who that was. Yeah, that's Jessica Johnston. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hear you great. Great. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me on this uh, session and especially to Molly for inviting me. Um, so you've all spent a lot of time talking about educational resources and uh, I'm the director of uh, education and diversity programs at the Ecological Society of America. And so I would like to invite you to submit your teaching ideas. Uh, we very much welcome a bi biodiversity collection in our eco ed digital library. And I did put the uh, a little blurb in the um, 
the Google Doc that you are all wor working on. So EcoEd DL, our digital library collection is peer reviewed and it's a partnership of four disciplinary societies. So uh, all the submissions really reach a much far, a much wider audience than the ESA membership. And I, at this point, I'd just like to turn it over to Jessica Johnston, our education programs coordinator, and she'll show you how straightforward that process is. Uh, thanks, Teresa. Um, so yeah, the EcoEd Digital Library is actually um, a great resource for you to get your, um, your, or a great place to get your resources published. Um, it is free of cost. You just sign up and uh, create an account and um, you can add your new resources and I was going to quickly show you uh, one of our recently published resources. Um, basically, all it asks, uh, there's a different, you could do different types of resources, um, images, lab activities. Um, this is an assignment activity, it's a non-laboratory. So there's a lot of flexibility in the types of resources that you could submit. And um, when you're submitting your resource, it asks for metadata just so that we can point the people who are looking for your resources in the right direction. So if your uh, resources are for undergraduate level or K through 12, um, if they relate to vision and change or the uh, NGSS or NGS, yeah, NGGS? No, I always NGSS. get that mixed up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, so it's a fantastic way to get your resources published and um, to a broader audience. And that's really just about it. We'll be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. And also Jessica is here to help if anybody has any issues with the actual submission or any questions about the submission process. But like I said, I did put the, uh, some links on the Google Doc. Yeah. Do you want to share your contact information um, in either the Google Doc or the chat? Um, yes, I did. We, we, I put a, a, an EcoEd digital library email, kind of a generic okay, email. Okay, I there. see it yeah. there, yeah. Mm -hmm. so and also the, the URL, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very awesome. Um, so yeah, I think we, that kind of concludes our session. We can answer any other general questions that anybody had um, about EcoEd or about anything like that, or any of our other panelists. But I also just want to point out that um, with this new um, committee at Spinach and through also the Cubes Hubs and through EcoHead, there's so many ways that we could all be sharing the resources that collections have to offer for educational materials. And I really hope that after this session, we all keep talking. We, we have all of our contact information. So if anybody in the session um, has something that you're interested in or you want to find out more about uh, publishing your materials or sharing your materials through all these different platforms and then also getting more involved in spinach education activities please add your name at the bottom for the committee um, and reach out to, to folks about getting your resources out there and I'm going to put the survey for the um, session here in the chat um, and it's also in the Google Doc. And does anybody else have any final, final words? I just, I want to throw another big shout out of thank you and gratitude to the organizers of the Spinach Conference this year because it's, it's oh, been yeah. nothing short of a miracle to have it pulled off. Um, and especially even today, they helped us transition to it. We had some last minute technical difficulties and, and it's just been wonderful to have um, people like so Leah's in here with us today, but there are a, a, there's a much larger group of people that have been putting this conference together. Yes, absolutely. And thanks for all the presenters for being willing to share their resources as well, and for bearing with us and translating all of this to a, a virtual space. Um, that's been great. So please remember to fill out the uh, survey yes. so we can find out you know, how this worked out.